welcome everyone. Happy, happy, happy day, uh, evening, night, whatever time it is where you are to another episode of the Silk Talking Sisters podcast. I'm the host, Dr. Teresa J. Canada. And today, in the next couple of episodes, I'm going to talk about some of the things that I discussed in my book, uh, Desegregation in the New York City Schools, A Story of the Silk Stocking Sisters. So today's part one, I'm going to discuss the history a little bit of the New York State slash New York City public school desegregation efforts. A little hit you about how this, what led to me being part of the process of desegregating the New York City public schools. So first, I'll give some backdrop on the actual um, topic of the history. It goes back to the 1800s. Um, and it's interesting, many, many people, well, I know some people didn't understand or did not know, I, even some former students were unaware of the fact that schools were segregated in the North, which I thought was interesting that the person would say that. Um, but if you don't know the history, how are you going to know the difference? So I'm going to use this podcast as a platform to just basically share the information myself and other people who invited as guests to talk about topics that can educate um, or give people a chance to think and process and learn something, but also share information and grow from there and hopefully make a difference moving, moving forward. So today's topic, I'm going to go back to what happened in New York State. Um, in eight, from 1883 to 1885, Governor Grover Cleveland, he was the governor of New York State at the time, signed a bill that abolished, quote unquote, segregated schools in the state of New York. Yes, they were color, you know, uh, colored schools, they were called colored schools. So he signed a bill that abolished colored schools in the state of New York in 1884. And the next governor, who was Governor Theodore Roosevelt, he too supported um, and reinforced this uh, effort to abolish colored schools in the state of New York. And yet and still, the desegregation of New York, New York City public schools did not begin until 1957. Go figure, right? Okay, so that tells us how far we've come and how far we still need to go. So let's look at, look at what happened uh, in the country in 1900s. In 1900, residential segregation accelerated throughout the United States. Just, you know, separated all across the United States, segregated housing. Okay. And which led to de facto segregation in New York City. Um, so what does that say? That meant that people attended schools if they attended schools in their neighborhoods with which they lived. Not much of that has changed, mind you, but that's pretty much the standard situation. So if you lived in a certain neighborhood, you attended the neighborhood school. And of course, if we have uh, segregated housing, you're going to have segregated schools. Um, but there was a little glimmer of, glimmer of hope in the 1990s, 1920s, pretty much in Harlem in particular. I'm just focusing right now on what's happening in Harlem, New York City. There was a time where the consequences of segregation was, in a sense, counteracted by cultural climate of the new Negro movement, which it was called, which we then now know as the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and what was going on in the Harlem Renaissance era? Well, this was the time period when, in fact, uh, there was an increase in a renewed sense of racial pride for Black people in particular. Uh, cultural self uh, expression, and that goes with a lot of literary things, you know, was taking place during that era. Um, Writing uh, by different uh, 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 authors in, in, in Harlem. Economic independence and progressive politics that was also taking place during the Harlem Renaissance. This was like during the 1930s. So that was a, a jump start to try to challenge some of the things that had happened. Um, after this racial segregation. Now, mind you, all the people who were in Harlem, these people talk about, they lived in Harlem. You had the writers lived in Harlem. You had the, the, uh, the singers, dancers, educators. They all lived in Harlem. So you could see people who 
had these different interests or efforts and so forth and cultural icons. Uh, and that's significant because you know what? You don't have it today, unfortunately. And that, I think, is an issue that we have to think about because if you don't see it, you really can't see it. Um, so that was 1920s. Of course, after 1920s, we know what's happened. Things just kind of like didn't, you know, just, you know, just like, the, the whole lynching era, blah, blah, blah. So let's see what happened next. The 1954 Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision was really catalyst behind the uh, aggressive move of the New York City public schools to desegregate. That was the, the catalyst that prompted the New York City public schools to consider desegregating their schools. So in 19, also, it was also in 1954, which is the same year that the Brown decision was made. There, the New York, okay, this is the New York City. So the Urban League of Greater New York, which is a, a nonprofit organization that was helping to you know, support issues for Black people in this time frame and still does uh, some, some work as well in terms of promoting and helping support financially, educationally, economically, and different issues for Black people. The, the, the Urban League of Greater New York asked Dr. Kenneth B. Clark, who, uh, well-known, renowned psychologist, who was basically responsible for assisting the Brown decision with the support of the Dow study. If those of you who don't know about Kenneth B. Clark, you need to look it up, all right? So I'm sharing with you the names of these people so that you can do your own extension and information. Dr. Clark is known for the Dow studies. And what he did, which was also used as part of the basis of understanding how Black ch children viewed themselves, he would present a white doll and a Black doll and say to a, a child, which child do you think is the good doll? Which child do you think is the bad doll? Which doll do you think is the pretty doll? Which doll do you think is not so pretty doll? Different questions he would ask these children. And the Black children pretty much majority always chose the white doll as the good doll. The white doll is the pretty doll. The white doll is the smartest doll. So this was a psychological kind of a, a test to show that images, self-images for children who were Black were negatively impacted, impacted at that point. So um, the key piece right now is to um, prepare a paper Dr. Clark was asked to prepare a position paper on the problems of de facto segregation uh, in the New York City public schools, right? This is based upon his research and based upon his expertise in working with psychological issues. Because a lot of the psychological things that were taking place impacted the children, you know, in, in not just the schools, but in the neighborhoods. So based on the presentation, Dr. Clark presented this, uh, you know, position paper. Um, and based upon this paper, which emphasized that the quality of education that children in segregated schools received was continually deteriorating, so that Black children were not improving in their educational efforts in segregated schools. This led the Board of Education, which at the time in New York City schools was called the Board of Education, it's not called that now, but at the time, it was called the Board of Education. The Board of Education decided to request that the Public Education Association, which is a volunteer organization, it's a volunteer organization which, you know, basically functions um, in terms of participating in the, you know, the, the uh, public education system and of New York City and interaction with Board of Education officials um, and organizations that could basically affect the quality of public education in the city of New York. I think that started 1895. I think it was established in 1895. And I think it, at least it was still active until the late 1990s. It might still be active now, but I know it was still active until, you know, late 1990s. So this was an, you know, a basically volunteer organization that served with New York, New York City public schools and some colleges and colleges as well, I think, in New York City. But that is the organization that um, was asked by the Board of Education to conduct a study to assist in integrating the schools in New York City. That was their goal, to be able to assist in finding ways to assist in integrating 
the New York City public schools. That's what the NAP Public Education Association was asked to do. With the information based upon Dr. Um, Kim Clark's research and his position paper that was presented to the Board of Education. So now what happens? Okay, this is 1954, as I mentioned before. In December 1954, the Board of Education in New York City authorized by resolution the Commission on, Integra on Integration. That was a call. It was the um, Commission on Integration. That was what they, they, you know, decided to have this, you know, authorization of a Commission on Integration. That was a significant piece. So that was in the end of December 1954. Now, this resolution requires the Board of Education to devise a plan to prevent more social, racial segregation and to integrate the schools that are already racially segregated. That was the goal, to be able to, you know, basically develop a plan. What are we going to do to prevent more racial segregation in New York City public schools? And what are we going to do to make, you know, to, to, you know, to deal with integrating schools that were already racially segregated. So the commission on integration consisted of 37 civic and educational leaders that got together to develop a plan, uh, to develop a plan. Simple as that, to develop a plan. And the guidelines of the commission was to study and recommend solutions for the problematic the problematic issues of de facto segregation and unequitable un 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 or unequal educational opportunities that resulted from the residential segregation of Blacks, Puerto Ricans, and other so-called minority groups in the city at the time. So that's just the beginning pieces to tell you there was a process taking place in 1954, that we're just trying to find a way to prevent the continuous segregated school system and find a way to integrate the schools. And this was basically a way to, to avoid having to deal, you know, basically, even with the de facto segregation in terms of housing issues or where people lived in the city. So that was the plan um, that was thinking about, and that was the group that was helping to decide and plan. So at the next time that you know, you know, I, I want to say this is what's beginning. So I'll talk about some of the things that were implemented. This is all, these are all topics that I discussed in my book. And you can always pick up the book and, and read it for yourself or check with your university libraries, uh, university libraries all across the country and all across the world. So you just check World, world Cat and you can see where the book is available. And maybe you can just, uh, you know, get a loan or the school. That, that, I know New York City, uh, like, New York City Public Library, the Schomburg has a copy available that you can sit there and read as well. So check it out and see what you think about it. But I will continue this discussion on the history of desegregation in the New York City schools in particular um, and how they made plans to try to eliminate some of this based upon the fact that we still were dealing with de facto segregation in the New York City um, in New York City. So until next time, uh, stay tuned so you can hear the rest of what really actually was implemented in the New York Public Schools. And you'll learn more about that and hopefully share that information. And hopefully we'll talk about what is ahead. What can we do at this point um, moving forward in terms of not just New York City, but in particular New York City and other schools that are impacted by I should say the resegregation of schools because the demographics are changing and every, as we speak. So until next time, thank you for listening. And I look forward to seeing you the next time um, that we have the podcast episode. And um, have a great day, evening or night, wherever you are around the city, the state, the country, the world. And we'll see you next time on the Silk Docking Sisters podcast. Bye now.